All right. How's everybody doing tonight? Good, good. Hope everybody enjoyed their Easter. Um, hope everybody found all the eggs that were out there. <laughs> eggs are completely different than Christmas lights. You can leave them up for six months, but not the eggs. So, um, but yeah, I, I'm, we had a great time last uh, last week, as Justin was saying. Wednesday or Thursday and, and Friday and Sunday was just just amazing. So uh, so glad that you guys all came out. Um, but tonight we're going to be in uh, in Acts chapter one. Um, since uh, we just celebrated the the resurrection, uh, we had a, the whole resurrection week. Uh, just kind of wanted to, to follow up on that and uh, kind of talk about what happened after that. You know, Jesus's resurrection is the most important event in in human history by far. Uh, John MacArthur explained it this way. He said, the the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the single greatest event in history of the world. It is the foundation of Christianity that no one who denies it can be a true Christian. A person who believes in Christ who was not raised believes in a powerless Christ, a dead Christ. If Christ did not rise from the dead, then, then no redemption was accomplished at the cross. And from quoting Paul, he says, your faith is worthless and you're still in your sins. Yeah, in the Bible, there's, there's what we call gray areas, things that we might not agree upon, things that we, we see differently. But despite these disagreements, we can still call each other brother and sister. But the resurrection is not one of them. The creed we find in, uh, in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, it, it's a, it's a non-negotiable creed. He said that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. But as, as important as the resurrection story is, the fact of, of that event in our life, that's not the end of the story. You know, Justin covered the resurrection on, on Sunday. Obviously, we had Easter. And if you miss it, please do yourself a favor and, and go and listen to that. But, but uh, what happened after the resurrection? Where, where did Jesus go? What did he do? You know, we read that, that Jesus actually walked amongst us for, for 40 days. 40 days he was walking amongst us after his resurrection. And... And so, again, I asked, what was he doing for those 40 days? Why was he here? So let's pray. We'll, we'll get into the scriptures and, and see what, what the Lord has for us. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this evening, Lord, this time that you've given us to, to study your word, to, to worship you in, in song and, and just praise, Lord. We thank you for, for what you've done on the cross. And, and last week as we celebrated that, it, it was just amazing to, to celebrate with our brothers and sisters. But it's also amazing, Lord, that, that you came back and, and you walked with us and you talked with us and, and clarified things. And, and so we thank you for that. And I just ask that you be with us tonight, that you help us to understand your word, help us to understand your meanings, what you've called us to do and, and where you're calling us to be, Lord. So again, we just thank you. We lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, we're, we're in Acts 1, chapter 1, just uh, verses 1 through 3. It says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So the, the first question is, who is this Theophilus that's, that's in this book here? He's, he's mentioned twice in scripture, uh, both times by Luke, uh, first in, in Luke's gospel and the second time here in, in Acts. But who is he? I don't really know. And to be honest with you, his identity doesn't really matter for, for this message anyways. So, 
so we'll just skip that. But, but what I do know is that Luke knew a man whose, whose name or either his title was Theophilus. And that God, through his sovereignty, inspired Luke to record these things of Christ and address them to this man. But what I, I do find interesting about this man, Theophilus, is, is his name. See, Theophilus is a Greek name. It's a, it's a Greek word comprising of two different words. Uh, we have theo, meaning God, and then we have phylos, meaning a friend. So his name actually means that, that he's a friend of God. Now, what, is, what does Scripture say about God's friends? Who has the privilege of, of being the friend of God? Well, we know that, uh, that Abraham, in uh, James 2, 23, he was called the friend of God. This, this same Abraham, Abraham who was considered the father of our faith, he was called the friend of God. Now, now following after Abraham, that, that's kind of a hard act to follow. I mean, the, the trust he had when God said, come out of the land where you were born and, and raised, and I'm going to take you to a place I'm going to show you. He got up and left. The faith he had in, in God when God said, sacrifice your only son, Isaac. He was willing to do that. The brass this man had when, when he negotiated with God over Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, who else would have, have the temerity to stand in front of God and, and do these things? You know, we can, we can look at, it, at Abraham as a friend of God, but who else can be called the friend of God? And there was Moses in Exodus 33. It says that the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man would speak to his friend. There was David in Acts 13. Uh, it says that God says that I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. But what about you guys? What about me? Jesus said in, in John 15, he says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has, has no one than this, that, than that one should lay down his own life for his friends. Jesus says, you are my friends. If you do whatever I command, you are my friends. No longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Jesus has, has laid his life down. He's laid it down for you. And if you accept this, if you listen and do the things that, that he's commanding of you, and he's not commanding because he wants to suppress you, he's doing it because he loves you. As he said in, in Jeremiah, he says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So if you'll follow him in all that he asks, then he says that you will be called my friend. So let's forget about this man, Theophilus, just for a moment and look at this. Luke Luke, under the inspiration of God, wrote these things down for the, the, the Theophiluses, Theophiluses of the world, for the friends of God. <laughs> he wrote these for the friends of God, for you and for me. But why? Why did, why did he write that down? Why was it so important that God inspired Luke to write these for us? In Luke 1, it says, Inasmuch as as many have taken in hand to set in order, in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. What was that last thing he said there? What did he say? He said 
that you may know the certainty of these things. Not that you can believe in something or that your thoughts can change for this, but that you would know that these things are certain. The things that Luke wrote in his gospel, they're undoubted truths. All of scripture is undoubted truths. They're truths that that we can build our faith upon. But they are still truths whether we believe them or not. So let's look back at at tonight's verses and, and kind of dig into them because I want to look at these things and events where um, and events we're going to cover in the light of a they are the truest thing in existence and B you are his friends and if he loves you to the point of laying down his life for you what wouldn't he be willing to do for you so again in Acts 1 it says the former account I made O Theophilus of all that Jesus began to began both to do and teach until the day he was taken up. He's saying, remember, remember all the things that, that I've told you. Remember all those things that I've written down for you about the healings that Jesus did, the teachings, the casting out of demons. All of it was written down that we may know for certain the things that God has done. You know, God has preserved his word from the moment he inspired it. From the moment he told Moses to write down the first five books to the moment he told Luke to write this, he was going to preserve those things as his scripture. But the book we have here, the, the entirety of scripture, it was, it was compiled and completed and it's been preserved for us since 397 AD. So this collection of books here, This book is the same book that they've had for over 1,500 years to give you peace and understanding and trust that this is the word of God. And so Luke continues, he says, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So it's saying after he was taken up, through the Holy Spirit, he had given these commandments to his apostles. But what we see here is that Jesus is still involved in their life. God is always with you, and, and I pray that, that you guys know that and understand that. And I don't mean it in the way of he's always with you because he's looking over your shoulder trying to condemn you or catch you doing something. I say that because Jesus cares for you. God cares for you. One of the last things that that Jesus had said before he was taken up, he says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That was an an encouragement he was giving to his disciples. Disciples, he was saying that you need to go out into the world and and make disciples of this world, but don't worry, I'm going to be with you. And so Jesus, he ascends into heaven where he sits right now at the right hand of God, but the Holy Spirit has come and indwells all those who believe. And he indwells us to to encourage us and to empower us for all of those who are called the friends of God. Jesus says that, or God says that, he he has said that he will never leave you or forsake you. And then in Psalms, it says that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And so knowing that that he is guiding us through this life, we look back at verse 3 and see this guidance in action. Verse 3 says, To whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So for 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus walked, he talked, he ate with his people. 
just a, a, a timeline after his resurrection, we've got Jesus walking with two of his followers as they walk to the road of, to Emmaus. We have Jesus appearing to his disciples not once but twice, almost supernaturally, as he just appeared into the room. We have him meeting his disciples in, for an early morning breakfast on the beach. I mean, it's pretty nice, right? He restores Peter back to his, his discipleship, to his apostleship. He gives his disciples the great commission of making disciples of all the nations, and then he ascends into heaven. Now, that, that seems like a lot of work, right? I mean, why come back for 40 days? You know, I said it earlier that, that Jesus' resurrection is the most important event in history. Why was that not just the end of it? I mean, Jesus could have died. He could have been buried. And as he rose, he just keeps going up into heaven. I mean, why stop here? And why couldn't that be the same for us? You know, at the moment of salvation, we're just taken out of here. Yeah, I know life is hard sometimes, and it gets harder when you become a Christian. Things that, that didn't seem to bother you before, they just weigh heavy on you now. Relationships that you've had, at worst, they're broken. At best, they become awkward, you know? We have the constant battle of, of trying to leave our burdens at the cross. You know, Jesus says, give me your burdens and, and I'll, I'll give you rest. And so what do we do? We, we say, okay, Jesus, I'm, I struggle with this and these are my sins and oh yeah, this too. And, and we fold it up and we're like, okay, yeah, let's put, oh, you, you don't want to get it? Oh, I'm, I'm going to just put it in my pocket. You know, we'll save it. We'll give it to you later. Why do we do that? Why am I left here to struggle in this life? To struggle with my doubts? To struggle with my in feelings of insecurities and inadequacies? Feelings of ineffectualism? Why am I left here to struggle in my sins and constant failures? The, the short answer is God is working on you. And I don't mean to make light of the situation. I know things can get heavy. But we have his word of promise. And he says that he will, what he has begun in you, he will complete until the time of Christ. And so if, if your day of salvation was the best day of your life, if that glorious moment when you realize that God loves you, you have been redeemed and there is a place waiting for you. If that moment is as good as it gets, just know that in Psalm, in the Psalms it says, a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wickedness. Life is hard and I hear you, but God is bigger than that. But what about Jesus? <clears throat> Jesus was around for, for 40 days after his resurrection. It wasn't for his sake. He didn't need anything. But it was for his disciples' sake. It was for those who followed him. It was for us. See, the number 40 in the Bible is often associated with, with testing. You know, we, we see Moses who was tested in the desert for 40 years before uh, God called him to go speak to the Pharaoh. We have the children of Israel wandering around the desert for 40 years, getting rid of all their old, old habits, basically. Their old people were dying, but besides that, it was a cleansing period. Moses, he fasted for 40 days on Mount Sinai as he was getting the Ten Commandments. Jesus himself fasted for 40 days as he was tested in the wilderness by Satan. And so Jesus was around for 40 days to test, to refine, to, to reinforce and kind of carve off the edges 
for those people who would go out and change the world. Those who would hold fast to their faith, to the truth, and pass it down to the point where we have it. But why would he need to do this? Jesus walked with his disciples for three years. He was still teaching them. He was still doing miracles. For three years he did this. And then he feels he needs to come back for 40 days. I mean, for me, if, if I'm studying something for three years, 40 days is not going to make it any better. And, and so we see here that, that no, one, no one really seemed to understand what Jesus was saying before this. Jesus taught, and they just didn't understand. Jesus repeatedly told them that he was going to be delivered up to the authorities, that he was going to die, but that he was going to rise again. And yet everyone still acted as if this isn't really going to happen. And to be honest, you know, it's, it's a little out of the ordinary for somebody to rise from the dead. I mean, they saw Jesus bring Lazarus back to life, but that was Jesus. He was the bringer back to life for a guy, you know. Now that Jesus is dead, who's going to bring him back? It's just, it's hard to fathom what's going to be going on. Also, Jesus did and said some things that were kind of hard to understand. You know, let's just be honest, they were kind of crazy, right? Some of the things he said. There's a show that my, my wife and I used to watch, and there was a guy, one of the characters, he was in a band. And they were always changing the name of this band. And one of the names that I thought was funny was uh, God Hates Figs. Because there's a, there's a story in the Bible that uh, talks about Jesus and a fig tree. Jesus comes to this fig tree and finds that there's no fruit on it. Jesus proceeds to curse this fig tree, and it immediately starts to die. And as somebody standing by, it'd be like, it just doesn't have figs. Why do you got to kill the tree? I mean, it's just an odd thing that, that that would happen. Jesus had also made statements that, that were kind of hard to understand or grasp. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it back up. People just assumed that he was speaking of the temple in, in Jerusalem. And you can't really blame them. I mean, that was an odd statement. Probably if, if I was one of the followers that heard him say that, I'd be thinking the same thing. I would add some questions, though. I mean, I'm kind of handy, and Jesus is a carpenter, and some of the disciples were pretty strong labor per people, so, I mean, I guess we could do some of the repairs. But where were the materials going to come from? I mean, he, we'd just seen him feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, so I guess he could supply the material, but, in, but how would we do this? Because at that point, they didn't understand the spiritual context of what was going on. At this point, Jesus kind of sounds more like a contractor that's over-promising deadlines on this one. But one of the, the events during the 40 days that Jesus walked with, his, with the people was a story about how he was traveling with two of his followers to, this road, uh, to Emmaus. Now, the two men, they didn't know that, that Jesus was with them. It says that, that their eyes were restrained, that they did not know him. And I don't know why they couldn't recognize him, but nevertheless, they, they still walked with him. Now, this journey was about seven miles, so they had some time to talk. And it, it says in Luke that, that Jesus began at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things that were concerning of himself. Now the two men, they did not know what, what to make of, of the events of this past week. I mean, they saw Jesus crucified. They, they know that there's an empty tomb. So it's all just kind of strange to them. But it says at the end of the journey, uh, then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. 
And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while, we, while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? The scriptures were opened to them. And I don't believe Jesus physically took out the scriptures and was like, uh, yeah, that's me right there and there and over here too. Now, I, th I think what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This book, it's full of words. It's full of words that make up sentences, that make up paragraphs, that make up stories, that make up books. And you can read it and you can hear it. But unless you are spiritually minded, unless you have that mind of Christ, it's not going to make much sense to you. Now hear me on this. I, I, there are things that are still hard to understand in this. We don't just open this book and, and the Holy Spirit just showers the word upon us and imprints scripture onto us. No, we have to study it. We have to pray for understanding for it. Second Timothy says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Solomon says in Proverbs that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings to search out a matter. We have, we have the honor of searching the scriptures. And we have the privilege of having the one who wrote it help us to understand it. Seek his wisdom so that when Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up, we put down our hammer and our work boots and, and understand the spiritual connotations of what he's saying. Jesus walked the earth for 40 days after his resurrection to open the scriptures to us, to give us spiritual-minded vision for the things we see and we go through, to filter this world through, through the lens of scripture, having trust and assurance of the one who is in control. He walked the earth for 40 days after his resurrection to, to reinstate Peter and solidify the foundations of the church that would change the world. But back to our, er, our early question, why not at the moment of salvation can we just be taken away? And we'd forego the stress, we'd forego the anxiety, the self-loathing, the disappointment that we put ourselves through. Why not take us at our absolute best moment I hate to break it to you, but our best moments are like dirty rags to the Lord. But it's okay. He still loves you. And he wants to use you. You are his children. You are his friends. As image bearers of Christ, you are his representation of who he is here on this earth. A man named N.T. Wright said, Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project. Not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to colonize earth with the life of heaven. You have value, you have worth to the body. Do not rob the church of the gifts that God's given you. In John 5, there's, there's a story of Jesus healing a man who had an infirmity for 38 years. This man would, would lie at this, this pool. This pool was called the Pool of Bethesda, which was supposed to have healing properties. It was said that, that an angel would come down and, and stir up the waters, and whoever got in the water first would be healed. So you can just imagine the scene. Just tons of people laying around. People who were sick, 
people who were blind, people who were lame and paralyzed, just waiting for their turn to be healed. And it says that Jesus saw this man and he asked him, do you, do you want to be made well? This man said he wanted to be made well, but you know people kept getting in the water before him. And so Jesus responds to him. He says, take up your bed and walk. It says immediately the man was made well. He took up his bed and he walked. And what if we look at it the other way? What if Jesus said, do you want to be made well? And the man says, yes, I do. And Jesus touches him and boom, his body just lies dead right there. But his spirit is with the Lord, right? I mean, of course, who, who wouldn't want to be with the Lord? Paul, Paul even had this struggle, whether to be here with, with people or to be with the Lord. But God had use for this man. The kingdom of God had use for this man. His family, his friends, they needed to hear his witness of who Jesus was. In Romans 10, it says that, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they not hear without a preacher? We are all one body. We're different parts, every, and everyone is important to the church. You know, my early on in, in our dating, my wife taught me a, a saying, uh, I won't say it in Spanish, but it translates basically, you're putting cream on your tacos. <laughs> it's, it means that, that you're, you're boasting too much. You're, you're putting too much on yourself. Well, I do want to put a little cream on your guys' tacos. The church needs you guys. And not just this church. The church corporately needs Christian believers in Christ. God has given you talents. He's given you gifts. Are you using them for his glory? Serving isn't, isn't just what you see when you come to church. It's not just the worship. It's not just the teaching. Do you like cleaning? There are needs in the church. Do you understand audiovisual? There are needs in the church. Do you love decorating? Do you love planning? Do you love cooking and giving? There are needs in the church. This is, this is our testing time. This is our refining time. We need to pick up our cross and we need to follow after him. And what I mean is, is we need to take those struggles, we need to take those pains and those hurts, and we need to bear them, and we need to push on. And I'm not saying you need to bear them alone. You need to find people. You need to find someone to share them with. You need to find a group of people to share them with, to bear this life together with them. But don't let those things anchor you so that you are ineffectual. So that you are constantly in condemnation of yourself. There's no condemnation in Christ. Because there's a world out there that, that needs Christ. You are his image bearer. And they need you. You are here in this place, in this time, for this purpose. So what is it? What is your purpose? What is, what is it you're here for? Because mankind has needed God throughout history. And it's no different today. So will you purge the things from your life that are, that are weighing you down? And begin to do the things that he wants you to do? Or will we live just as nominal Christians being choked out by the weeds of the world? I pray that, that you see his desire for you that he has laid down his life for you, that he wants to call you his friend. And after 40 days, Jesus met with his disciples for the last time before he ascended into heaven. And he says, after Jesus ascended into heaven, his disciples worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. St. Augustine put it this way. He said, he departed from our sight 
that we may return to our heart and find him there. For he departed, and behold, he is here. Jesus has ascended, but God has not left us. We have, we have dwelling within inside of us the spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the spirit that hovered over the waters during creation, the same spirit that led the children through the desert and through the sea. He is within you, so I pray that you, you learn his voice, learn his calling, and do the things that he is asking you to do. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you have not abandoned us, Lord. As some people feel that, that you have abandoned, you have not, Lord. You are here with us. You are guiding us. You are protecting us. You have called us all to, to do be about our Father's business, Lord. And so you help us to see where you want us. Help us to see the callings you're putting on our, our lives, Lord. We again thank you for this time, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.